women across America have had their constitutional rights vindicated. The Supreme Court has sent a clear message to the tactics of politicians who've used underhanded means to shut down abortion clinics. Now, Whole Women's Health and the other clinics in the state of Texas will remain open. Much to the chagrin of a good number of Americans, legalized abortion is the law of the land. Roe v. Wade made it legal. However, there are individual state laws that regulate or limit abortion. And the battle to overturn that landmark ruling in pieces, and then in its entirety, remains one of the most contentious issues in this country. The Supreme Court ruling today was a big victory for supporters of abortion rights in Texas, where the court struck down a law that would have shut all but a handful of clinics in that state. It's part of an anti-abortion strategy of passing so-called clinic shutdown laws that opponents hope will lead to the eventual abolishment of abortion in America. It's the political fallout from this decision that draws much of the attention today in light of that Supreme Court that is still one just as short and still has conservatives determined to keep Hillary Clinton from the presidency in fear of what will happen to that court if she gains power. We'll deal with that. We'll add your phone calls in moments. Right after Miranda Kahn puts the Monday SCOTUS call in perspective. Thanks, Ed. Capitol Hill's reaction to the ruling was swift today. House Speaker Paul Ryan and several GOP lawmakers voiced their disappointment with that decision. Meanwhile, President Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Senator Bernie Sanders applauded the Supreme Court's ruling. Women won today! Women won today! Women won today! What was celebrated as a major victory for abortion right advocates... I want everybody to understand you don't mess with Texas women. Likewise served as a major setback for the pro-life movement. Today, babies lost and their mothers lost. On its last decision day of the year, the Supreme Court ruled five to three to overturn a Texas abortion law in what is probably the biggest ruling on abortion in nearly a decade. This case is huge. The 2013 Republican-backed Texas law required abortion doctors to have certain admitting privileges in order to treat patients and clinics to possess hospital-grade facilities. Abortion providers argued the regulations were medically unnecessary and aimed to shut down clinics. In the end, the court weighed in favor of the plaintiffs. This is a tremendous victory. We stand here today as members of the pro-life movement saying that we will not give up. Texas is one of several states that require abortion doctors to have hospital admitting privileges, part of the law the Supreme Court struck down. Ed, back to you. All right, thanks, Miranda. Let's get to the political matters at hand. Welcome back the veteran political analyst and strategist who has been advising the Donald Trump campaign on a daily basis in his informal role helping the Trump effort. And this week, his advice hits bookstores everywhere. Armageddon, How Trump Can Beat Hillary, where he reveals how conservatives can stop the president's plan to extend his influence and policies by seeking to have Hillary Clinton fill that chair on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Dick Morris once again joins the hard line. Dick, let's get right to it on the political side of things. Justice Anthony Kennedy sided with the court's liberals in this 5-3 decision. It is called the most significant legal victory in a generation on abortion rights. What is the political impact from the conservative side as they saw Justice Kennedy once again go to the side that they would prefer he did not? I think that it's um, uniformly helpful to the Trump campaign uh, and to the conservatives, even though they don't like the decision. On the one hand, it gives conservatives a goal to shoot for. It tells them that unless they add another two or three judges to the court, at least two, uh, they're going to continue to lose the Roe v. Wade issue. But it also tells liberals that and Democrats that the five-judge majority sustaining Roe v. Wade is still there and that that majority is not going to go away. This was the first decision in 20 years on abortion. And uh, it tells them that they're not hanging uh, by a thread above the fire. And that, I think, will have the effect, as you said in the opening monologue, of decreasing the salience of abortion. <clears throat> While at the same time, the Texas v. United States decision, the other Texas law, uh, the one on immigration, uh, is setting aside the Obama amnesty, that court decision also really helps conservatives because it puts their issue, immigration, front and center. Would then your suggestion be to Donald Trump to hammer away at this, to go at this tooth and nail, because many have called this the most important wedge issue in the 2016 race. Do you think that this is 
the winner, knowing that he goes after immigration, and that's a huge winner for him, but then does he have to take this on just as vociferously? By this, do you mean abortion? Yes, the abortion issue. No, no, I don't. I think that it's out there. I think that his position is known. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you ask people in the United States, are they pro-life or pro-choice? You have a narrow, narrow pro-choice majority. But when you say, how strongly do you feel? It's two to one. Uh, the people for abortion are more strongly on it than the people that are against it. Um, so it's not an issue he should run on. Immigration is the issue we should run on, and that's the issue that really, really matters in terms of this election. You're not going to pick up votes over abortion, but you are over immigration, particularly after the Brexit vote, Ed, because the Brexit vote was about immigration. Uh, the news media in the U.S. will never cover it that way. They want to cover it through economics because they don't want to turn off immigration. But ultimately, it was about immigration. I was a consultant to the lead people. Uh, their fight was about immigration. And uh, the, that fight can come across the Atlantic and be waged here just as easily. And I think Trump would be well advised to go back to and focus on immigration. We want your phone calls at 1-877-NEWSMAX. We're going to talk about Brexit a little more, about immigration after the break, Dick. But let me just get to this, because you talked about Donald Trump, and your suggestion is stay on immigration. His strong point, no doubt. But you talked about his position is known on abortion. To be honest, Dick, he has been very waffly on this. He is in 1989. He said he was very pro-choice. He has said it since then. He then, between 1999 and 2011, came out and said he was pro-life. Is it not fair to say that he needs to stay away from this because too many people are unsure what his exact issue, what his stance is? That's exactly true. And sometimes waffles taste really good. <laughs> but are they going to be good in an election like this? That's the question yeah, that people think, are going to have to answer, too. All right. 1-877-NEWSMAX, if you want to join us. Rick is in Nampa, Idaho. Rick, let's talk about this. You said it's not any of our business if women want to have an abortion. Go ahead and expand on that. Well, it's not. It's not my business. It's not your business. It's not the governor of the state of Idaho's business if a lady wants to have an abortion for whatever reason she wants to have it. It's her business. So then do you think that what the Supreme Court did was dad. proper? Do it's you a think family affair. It's not a public issue. Do you think then what the Supreme Court did was proper? Well, the thing about it is, yes, if it's the woman's choice. If she wants to do it, it's her business. It ain't mine. It's not yours. It's not Dick Morris's. Okay? I mean, if they want to do it, they can do it for whatever reason they have. You know, I was raised Catholic. I just hope it's a good reason and not just because, because. All right, Dick, let me go ahead and thank you very much for the call, Rick. Dick, let me get to this as well, because is it just possible here that with Justice Kennedy shifting over that he is moving to where the country is going? And I say that because we have to look at numbers. In the Pew Research Center, 56% of U.S. adults say abortion should be legal in most cases. 41% said it should be illegal. In the Gallup poll, most recent, Americans are choosing pro-choice for the first time in seven years. I know that this is not what the anti-abortion people want to hear, but is it possible that America is moving that way and Justice Kennedy is simply taking the country that way? It's going to be a tough road to hoe no matter what conservatives do. I think that's exactly right. Uh, this issue has been thoroughly debated and the left is clearly winning the issue. Uh, of course, when you drill down in the numbers, you get about 19% that say it should be illegal in all cases about 29% that say it should be allowed in all cases. And then the rest, which is over 50%, uh, say that it should be legal and illegal, depending on a case-by-case -case basis. But if you give the electorate a choice between a Ted Cruz, who is diametrically doctrinaire, opposed to abortion, and makes it a very high priority, and Donald Trump, who waffles on it, as you said, he used to be pro-choice, now he's pro-life, who knows what he is. Um, that ambiguity can be very helpful to him in making it much harder for Hillary to stir up terror and fear as the basis of her candidacy. All right, I got about 90 seconds left in this segment. Before we come back, I do want to get to this. The other Supreme Court ruling today, the Bob McDonnell decision, basically the Supreme Court saying that the theory in the case, the instructions given the jury on his corruption case were simply too broad. The Washington Post says this ruling could make convicting politicians of corruption almost impossible. Dick, what's your take? 
Well, it certainly makes it more difficult, but appropriately difficult. Uh, the court did not lay down a standard. The court said, you haven't given us a standard, and until you do, we're not going to affirm the conviction. In other words, McDonald got certain favors in return for setting up some meetings and doing some stuff for the business. Uh, but there wasn't anything like he signed a bill or he cast a vote or he favored a regulatory decision. He did some favors. Now, is it illegal for Hillary Clinton to set up meetings for Corn Dow Corning uh, to help preserve their upstate New York plant and then get hundreds of thousands of contributions from them? Is that a bribe under the McDonald conviction? It would be. And what they're really saying is you have to define what is the quantum of the favor. Is staying in the Lincoln bedroom in return for contributions uh, a crime? Well, then half of the, then Clinton and Obama would both be in jail. Uh, the, they said that you need to be clear at what point there is a threshold uh, of the importance of the favor and the magnitude of the gift. And a point of fact here that this was an eight nothing ruling here that pretty much smacks down and says the case was not well presented in the first place. Dick, hold on for a couple of minutes here. He will return after the break. We're going to tackle the polls, Bernie Sanders voters and where they go next and why few Republicans want anything to do with Donald Trump at the convention. one newsmax one newsmax Get on the line. We can't do it without you right here on The Hard Line. today because I'm with her. Yes, her. We're all here today because we're with her and we're going to work our hearts out to make Hillary Clinton the next president of the United States. Back to work, reminding you to get in line. We won't move forward without your comments. One eight seven seven Newsmax. Get ready to become part of the conversation. Welcome back, political analyst, New York Times best-selling author, whose latest book, Armageddon: How Trump Can Beat Hillary, is in bookstores this week. Let's welcome back Dick Morris. Dick, here we go. Hillary Clinton and Elizabeth Warren. Hillary Clinton working the crowd, telling her everybody there just how much she loves having Liz Warren at her side. And here's what she said. And I must say. I do just love to see how she gets under Donald Trump's thin skin. She exposes him for what he is, temperamentally unfit and totally unqualified to be president of the United States. All right, Dick, two-part question for you here from the strategic side. New polls, there's a lot of new polls out, let's face it, but a couple of the national polls out right now, one of them shows Hillary Clinton with a double-digit lead over Donald Trump. They're showing big numbers here for Hillary Clinton. But what about Elizabeth Warren here, too, in relation to all these polls, Dick? I mean, you would think that Elizabeth Warren is more than just an attack dog here for Hillary, but it seems like that's exactly the role that she's filling. Well, she's not on the ticket yet. She's auditioning. But I think that um, putting Warren on the ticket uh, would, would be a very risky move uh, because when you're running president and vice president, uh, you get held accountable to the lowest common denominator. Um, so, for example, a guy who was incredibly qualified to be president, John McCain, uh, had qualifications used as against him as an issue by putting Sarah Palin on the ticket because people said she's not qualified to be president and therefore I'm not going to vote for McCain. And Hillary has spent all this time building up her credentials of the foreign policy to be commander in chief. Uh, I don't think she's done well with Benghazi and all that, but she's tried hard. And by putting a person with zero foreign policy experience and zero uh, interest in the subject uh, on her ticket to be vice president, a heartbeat away from the presidency, in a sense she gives all of that back. I think it also is a statement that this is entirely a female candidacy. Men need not support. And the real variable in our politics these days is the uneducated, high school graduate, non-college, white male. And uh, the latest statistics show that they're much more numerous than we thought. And that is the vote that left the uh, Labour Party and went with the Brexit group to leave Europe. Uh, that is the swing group in our politics. And by putting two women on the ticket, it kind of types it as uh, men need not apply. 
Let's get on to something else here that's happening with regard to Donald Trump, because Politico reached out to more than 50 prominent Republicans, and they say few said they will attend the convention in Cleveland. Most of them do not want to speak. As a matter of fact, Dick, it seems as if they are running as fast as they possibly can to get away from Donald Trump. What's your take on those who say, I'm not going to go for this reason, that reason, whatever reason? By the way, Mike Huckabee said he'd love to speak if he is asked, but he's the only one that said it so far. I think that the whole business here is trumped up, no, no pun, uh, by the media. Uh, I do not think that Donald Trump is a uh, is a weight around the party's neck. I think that he has a tremendous capacity to generate support. And I think that the media is trying to make him into a sort of latter-day Barry Goldwater or George McGovern, uh, someone who's radioactive and you don't want to be seen with him, you don't want to be involved with him. And politicians who basically don't own a piece of Trump because he doesn't come up through the process uh, are anxious to double down on that. Is it still, though, uh, uh, let me stop you there for one sec, Dick. Is it still a media creation, though, when Politico goes out and asks the question, and you've got Mark Sanford saying, I'm not going to be there. Carlos Curbelo, I won't be there. Others coming flat out. That doesn't sound like a media creation at this point. It sounds like actually they're getting to people who say, I don't want to be there in the story. It's a shame that this isn't a gathering that Mark Sanford, who was hounded out of office as governor of South Carolina for having an affair, uh, chooses to grace him to grace. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure that's the uh, litmus test we ought to be using here. Uh, I think that, that this is all a job to try to paint Donald Trump as unelectable. And there are some Republican politicians who are finding it to their advantage to say that like Mark Kirk, who wants to get elected, re-elected senator from Illinois, a state he knows Trump is going to lose. So by posturing that he's not with Trump and he's independent, he racks up points with voters and they may say, oh, well, good, I want to vote for someone who thinks for himself, like Mark Kirk. And uh, there's also, bear in mind, a huge anti-Hillary feeling among the voters. So they don't say they're for Hillary, they just say they're not in, enamored of Trump. Okay, well, let's, let's, bring let's bring some voters in here. Let's bring some voters, let's get some voters in here because we, we are short on time. I want to make sure we get them in here at one eight seven seven newsmax Chuck is calling from West Virginia, and Chuck, you believe you want the Republicans to speak for Trump at the convention, but how do you get them to speak when they don't want to? Well, I don't think it's how you get them to. They sh if they're devoted to their party, they should willingly go out there and back Trump 100%, whether they like him or not just like the Democrats are doing. I'm sure there's a lot of Democrats that can't stand Hillary because of what she's done, and they know she's crooked, and they know what's going to happen in the White House if she gets in there. So, you know, we're not, the Republican Party is not a unified party. They're a bunch of crybabies that if they don't get their way, they're going to cry and run away and hoo-ha, and, 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 you know, it's ridiculous. I'm so sick and tired of the way this is all going. If they don't grow up in Washington, we should get rid of them, put a whole new staff in there, and take it from there. We can always call a temp agency and maybe get them in there. Chuck, thank you very much for your call. Dick, I want you to comment on that, but also in the, in the aspect here that the stories are out that the RNC is with Donald Trump. They're cracking down on the rebelling delegates right now. They're saying, you better get in line. And Donald Trump says, hey, if you're not going to support me, then go ahead and don't speak. But I think the bigger issue here is the RNC wants to crack down on him, but it doesn't. We've talked about this before, Dick. We've heard this word crack down before, and it hasn't done anything to put him in line yet. Well, uh, I think the RNC now should be for Trump, and I'm glad they are. Uh, the way you can lure these politicians to the podium to speak at the convention is very simple. Turn on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> It's not working, though. They say they don't. Oh, but let me just say this, though, Dick. Is it not fair to say that we still got a couple of weeks to go here? Everybody can say they may okay. not. But if you give no. them a prime place to speak here, that there's still yeah. politicians who may change their mind. Exactly. And Ed, who have you got? You cited two congressmen, one of whom uh, was discredited in a major scandal. Uh, do you have, uh, I mean, has Cruz said he's not going to come? Has uh, Kasich said he's not going to come? No, but, has, but Trey Gowdy has said that he won't go there. And also Elise Stefanik, who's the New York rep who helped to write the GOP platform of the 2012 convention, she said she's not going either. Well, I can see Gowdy not going because 
he needs to preserve a sort of above the fray view in terms of the Benghazi committee report. But you're not to, you're, what senators are you talking about? I mean, there's Sassy in Nebraska, and I think that's about it. Kirk is a little distant, but that's because he's running. Um, this is fomented by the media. They find one or two people who are marginal at best or looking for a headline or looking for a story who peddle it. Uh, there is no rebellion in the Democratic Party, in the Republican Party, against Donald Trump. There okay. is none. Okay, real quick here, let's go to Doris from Idaho, who says she doesn't support Donald Trump, but she says Republicans should speak for him. 30 seconds, Doris, go ahead. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I really think that Donald Trump should um, go on the immigration thing and also on the abortion. I really feel that it isn't the r r woman's right to choose, but it, um, that it's murder and that murder should never be committed. All right. We appreciate your call. Thank you very much, Dick. Before we get out of here, the Democrats issued their Benghazi report today saying that Hillary Clinton was not at fault. They want to get ahead of Trey Gowdy and the Republican committee. 45 seconds here. You expected this, didn't you? This had to come. Yeah. Uh, and I think their report is irrelevant. Uh, I think that report that the Benghazi committee, the majority, is going to issue will be very relevant. And let's face it, the Benghazi report has already been issued. It's called the movie 13 Hours. <laughs> well, but it was a movie, and let's be fair, it is not 100% accurate because we all know Hollywood takes a lot of liberties, correct? It's pretty accurate. Uh, it's pretty accurate that there was no backup. It's pretty accurate that four people died. Yep. Pretty accurate that Hillary had a lot. The British ambassador had an assassination attempt on his life, and the Brits pulled out their consulate. What more did Hillary need to know that she needed to increase security? I got a feeling I that as we get as we get closer to the convention and the election, 13 hours is going to be rented an awful lot by a lot of people. They'll be out buying that DVD. Speaking of buying, buy this this week. Dick Morris's new book is Armageddon, How Trump Can Beat Hillary. It is available in bookstores this week. It is what he believes the roadmap that Donald Trump should use to defeat Hillary Clinton this year. Dick, always a pleasure, my friend. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you soon. The numbers are clear in what Americans want in certain political issues of the day. But do they tell us the whole story? Coming up next with your phone calls right here on The Hardline.